for a couple of things that I want to talk about. I call this talk four interesting chronological problems. I mean, it's not me to tell you what you find interesting or not. But, uh, <coughs> so, yes, I thought uh, I would just discuss a few things in emerging research that I've been involved in over the last few years in my background working in, uh, coming from Belfast originally and Queen's University in our radiocarbon dating laboratory there and then my involvement in ERC funded projects uh, first in Malta and now in Spain looking at the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic there uh, centered around you know these various chronological problems but first of all I want to ask you all give yourselves a kind of personality test um, what do you think is more important what is chronology all about? Because two, in my mind, very separate themes are talked about when we talk about chronology. There are people who are interested in, as Ruth has just given out the plea for, addressing these specific problems and, you know, really using all the tools that we have at our disposal to, to answer specific questions, you know, as well as we possibly can. And that's incredibly important. So dating sites, working out when particular artifacts came into being, when certain events happened in environmental sequences, and when was the end of the Bronze Age, or you know, when did the Neolithic first arrive somewhere? And to do that, we need high quality data, we need fantastic samples, we need to be able to model their sequence and stratigraphy uh, using you know the, the methods, the Bayesian methods that exist. And then on the other side of uh, research traditions going on at the minute, and this is something I'm more involved in, is these more sort of uh, generalist things. So, you know, uh, what is the actual relationship between cultural taxonomies and activity levels in the past? Uh, what are the dynamics of the population in the past? I mean, this is a, this is a somewhat contentious issue, but it's something radiocarbon data is used for uh, an awful lot. And, um, you know, these methods are rather different because it involves big data, it involves getting all the radiocarbon data you can and putting it into a, a computerized bucket and extracting from that a, a model or, a, or a, a thing of interest. But you know, you can, you can then think about, uh, you can test hypotheses, you can fit mathematical models to these sequences, you can, you know, you can play around with uh, uh, testing your, 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 your prior theories of like to say collapse or exponential growth or cultural change so you know just just think you don't have to say but just think who you are what you are what interests you most i don't know depending on what day i say four or five days out of seven in the week i'm a generalist then it's also very great to get one's teeth into these specific problems every now and again and i'll be talking about both these things so my four problems, one, marine samples. Obviously the Mediterranean is an area defined by the sea rather than defined by uh, the land. And particularly in the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic, it would be wonderful to be able to address specific chronological problems using marine samples because shells in particular are some of the best samples that we have from the sites in question. And one of the big blank areas of research in the central Mediterranean, had it everywhere on earth actually really, uh, is the lack of a decent, well-controlled sample of uh, the, the so-called offsets, the marine offsets. The, the, uh, the, the waters of the ocean holds its carbon in a slightly different way to the atmosphere, so you can't use the atmospheric tree ring curve to calibrate radiocarbon dates that, that have been from creatures living in the sea. You need to use the, the, uh, the coral calibration curve. The you know marine cal 113 or whatever, but that regionally because of uh, because of ocean because of properties of the ocean and properties of the 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 water the, that carbon reservoir history is slightly different for every point on the Earth's surface, and you need to apply a local marine offset to any value that's been taken from the ocean and sea waters. And the problem is in the central Mediterranean that these numbers these local offsets are all over the place. You know. The minus 69 years, 139 years, plus 500 years, minus 316 years. So for addressing particular specific problems of when certain sites were, you know, particularly in the Mesolithic period, when in the Paleolithic it doesn't really matter because it dates to the you know 14th millennium, great. 
the, but if you really want to understand the interaction, say, between the Neolithic and the Mesolithic, or looking at fine grained cultural change, it's, it, it would be very, very useful. And for specific problems, this will remain mm. a problem. Uh, and in fact, there probably isn't even any uh, single value. The, the, it's, it's likely that the uh, marine reservoir effect has changed at each point in the Earth's surface over time as well as over space. But for more general problems, it ceases to become an issue because we can bootstrap the data in, in every possible way. We can program computers, and this is a wonderful thing about computers. You can program them to consider, you know, basically every single value, permutation, possible permutation of the data, and the average process that converges out of that uh, gives you a signal, and then you can you can put in extreme values and test that your analysis is, is sensitive to the what might be, you know, what, what you don't actually know about, about the world. And so uh, that is, you know, a solution to this problem. Again, paleo environments and data and paleo environmental change is an example of these specific events we'd like to get a good handle on. And the Mediterranean environments pose quite uh, significant problems in this regard. In Northern Europe, where we have lakes and bogs and uh, you know wetland sites, the archives of paleo environmental information are difficult to come by. And in the Mediterranean, they are, you know, there are lakes and wetlands, but they're not as they're not as commonplace, and they do have quite a lot of problems because of the rather steep uh, hypsometry, which is the shape of the Mediterranean landform in many places, the erodibility of the of the soil. And the season out, I mean, the beautiful weather of the Mediterranean, sometimes uh, it, it, when it rains, it rains heavily, and that causes a lot of flooding and a lot of hill wash. So our paleo-environmental sequences tend to be incredibly difficult to date using uh, standard techniques. So what you need to do is get an awful lot of radiocarbon dates from each sediment core, and then you have to think about them very carefully. So if you use the best Bayesian statistics, sort of process-based deposition models that you can uh, do in the software, which is called Bacon by Martin Blau. And then you can look at the landform itself. So I'm uh, looking at our ERC project in Malta that was based in Belfast. Uh, we can look at the landform. We can model how erosive that is. We can look at the potential for runoff, the potential for carbon cycling going on in that environment. And then we can look at the wrong dates, the bad dates, the ones that are being thrown out of the models, and try to see if they form any chronological pattern and hint at episodes of uh, intense erosion in the past and you know what that might mean. So here in Malta, we have uh, this intense phase of erosion uh, at, a, at you know at, right at the end of the Bronze Age, <clears throat> when society there was at its you know at one of its peaks. So that's all very interesting. And then we can also, and palynologists don't do this very well, but we can uh, be more critical of these age depth Bayesian models and look at the probability that we've actually detected stuff <laughs> and compare that to the radiocarbon uh, analysis of the, of the archaeological record and try to triangulate our, our proxies to make sure that uh, we actually do have concrete evidence for uh, both lines of evidence telling us the same thing is happening at the same time. And we can do this explicitly, you know, using the using the power of data science. So the third problem, and this is one that we get an insight into thanks to these big data perspectives, is edge effect and cultural change. So this is an example of unexpected patterns emerging from analyses when we look at it in this new way. So rather than thinking, right, when does the Neolithic start? Or, you know, what association, cultural associations does this radiocarbon data have? We're just looking at all the data and looking at the, the overall scale of activity, that clustering of data that Ruth has referred to, and just look at when that happens. So we get our data, put it in the database, plot all these models and say, it's well known. Uh, in Greece here, there's this big cluster at 6,000 BC. Yeah. But why then in Iberia, do we get the same thing going on in the, in the Mesolithic? You know, right out here in, in the Atlantic facade of Portugal. And then when you look at these other different places at different times, they have sometimes the same kind of peaks 
happening in the same sorts of time. And this 6000 BC event is particularly prominent. You know, it's this is this is a Neolithic, this is the Neolithic wave of advance. So you see it here in Greece at 6000 BC, crosses over to southern Italy a bit after that. And then you see it, you know, going up central Italy, northern Italy, Switzerland, you know, as, as it gets further away from the from the Mediterranean, it happens later and later. It's when you get to Northern Europe, it's happening where I'm from in Ireland at six, 3,662 BC. I know that exactly. And I noticed when I was putting this together, uh, there's a little wiggle down here in Ireland at 6,000 BC. And if I zoom in on that, that ah, doesn't work. Oh well, well, believe me, if I zoom in on it, there's actually a big peak uh, at 6,000 BC too. So what on earth is going on? What on earth is going on? I mean, is this a calibration thing? Well, no, because of the way that we analyze the data uh, using the, the statistically speaking, we're going to exclude that. And what I think is going on is that it's perhaps an interaction. A uh, <coughs> my fingers do not. Um, it's a it, when you get a large we, the emerging consensus, both from archaeology and from uh, ancient DNA, is the Neolithic really was this this wave of advance, this migration of people in on mass. And so what happens to the areas in which they're migrating in? Is there a knock-on effect? You know, is there a kind of bow wave that is being forced out from this Neolithic wave of advance? And, and therefore you might see in these marginal places like Ireland and like Iberia, you know, people like hunter-gatherer communities sort of getting more marginalized, increasing, <coughs> perhaps their economy being influenced by the Neolithic as well. Uh, and there's a spooky action at a distance uh, that, that, that seems to be related to what's going on in the Mediterranean right out of the periphery of Europe, I think. And how can we understand that? Well, it's very difficult to get any kind of direct, uh, you know, conclusive evidence for this, but we can look at the interaction between these sites, the way in which they relate to in the landscape. We can draw on studies in uh, modern day social network analysis and in primatology and like it, uh, in, in network science is applied to modern medicine to look at how disease vectors in populations because there are certain properties of sites and how they're distributed in the landscape that correlate with, with the properties of networks. And so this is, I think, going to be a very, very uh, profitable avenue of, of research. And this is something in our ERC project in Alicante we are really in, engaged in trying to do. So watch this space. So finally, I want to talk about the gaps that Ruth also mentioned. So this is very close to my heart because this is our ERC project that Owen and I met on when we were working out in Fraxis. And in fact, this was the first dig we, we dug on together in Santa Verna, and I was sort of supervising it. And my job was to try to get a decent chronology for this site, a decent Bayesian chronology for the various, there's, this is a, one of these megalithic temples in Malta with its floors, you can sort of see these sequence, and that's great. But amazingly, the site underneath it, there was a sort of uh, village of, uh, of mud brick houses that had been uh, dated to the early Neolithic. Uh, we knew that from the pottery, the Scorba Pieria pottery that was there. And uh, that's great because we suddenly had this wonderful stratified sequence layer upon layer. So uh, I you know, uh, tried to implement the best possible strat sampling strategy that I could. I got, I took, you know, Tons of soil samples. Everybody was fed up carving soil stuff, soil samples away from the site and wet sitting and getting as much dating information, trying as hard as we possibly could to get a, a sequence that really, you know, evenly spanned the whole the whole stratigraphy. And instead, what we got was this clustering of dates back in the early Neolithic. Nothing for an entire millennium, and then you know, large amounts of activity in the in the Copper Age or the Temple Period, as we call it in Malta. And then you know, really nothing in between. So, you know, the question is, and it's a persistent question in archaeology, is how much can you read into this? What is negative evidence? What's the rule of negative evidence? And in radiocarbon dating, what does this actually mean? And I think in interpreting individual radiocarbon dates, one has to bear in mind that each radiocarbon date often isn't, you know, it's only a proxy indicator of the age of the thing we're interested in. What radiocarbon dates often are are individual indicators of human activity in some form. Charcoal is somebody lit a fire at some point and burned something. You know, it's that kind of basic level of energy <laughs> expenditure. And we got residuality. So we got a lot of this early Neolithic stuff ended up in context here, but still nothing from in between. And I think 
when you really understand a site and its and its deposition, you can start to make these these inferences, at least about that site. And uh, we then went to other sites to see if this sequence uh, came to be confirmed at other sites and uh, at, well, one other site it, it has. So yes, what you know, how can we how can we do this? Well, the solution really uh, <coughs> it's a bit of a it's, it's a bit of an empty answer. Just do more digging and get more get more samples. But, you know, there are plenty of gaps in the map. There are plenty of regions that haven't been sampled very much. And we knew how mobile people were in the past. We know how uh, cultures can, you know, move about. And it could be that we're just simply missing some of these things. We can also, uh, as I referred to before, that's why paleo-environmental work and paleoecology is incredibly important. And then we can, uh, do the statistical modeling to sort of say, right, well, given the data that we have, what is the likelihood that this really is an empty phase? So, you know, we can say, well, it's not the zero percent probability, but there's a there's a reasonable probability. And uh, <coughs> oh dear, this didn't work. I'm having problems with the figures, but you can also do this density modeling modeling exercise at a range of different analytical scales to really more precisely identify the minimum amount of time for a site or a landscape or a region or whatever your scale of analysis is, doesn't actually have any any actual points of data associated with it. So to conclude, really, uh, uh, you know that's a, that's just a smorgasbord of, of uh, random ideas from the from the cutting edge of chronological research that uh, I'm uh, honoured to be involved in and the projects that I've worked in and with the people that I do work with. Uh, I think it's thinking through chronology is one of these fundamentally important things. Um, and I'll just leave you this quote from one of my favorite Stoic philosophers, Marcus Aurelius. Frequently recollect what changes thou hast observed. The world is a continuous change. Life is opinion. That's my philosophy. Thank you very much.